So I want to talk about quantum physics, emergence, and time. And uh, I'm going to talk about three puzzles. The puzzle of quantum physics, emergence of complexity, and time, and space-time. Puzzle of quantum theory is that quantum theory is a linear theory, but the real world is not linear. And the question is, how are these compatible? Nowadays, it is often claimed there is a unitarily evolved wave function of the entire universe from which all else follows. Hence, all that happens is based on the linearity of a single function. There's a problem somewhere here, even if the function lives in a very high dimension of space. And I must say that I don't believe that uh, we can really seriously deal with infinite spaces. One shouldn't confuse very large with genuine infinity, because infinity is not a very big number. But the problem is to make sense of how a real world, non-linear real world, fits in with a linear quantum field. What you have to fit in is the hierarchy of biology, your physics space, atoms, molecules, biomolecules, the basic level of cells, tissues, organs, body systems, organisms, populations, communities, and ecosystems. And that's the crucial context for the rest. And this is not remotely linear. So how does it emerge from quantum physics? Let me first talk about the essential linearity of quantum physics. And I wrote a paper about this called On the Limits of Quantum Theory, Contextuality and a Quantum Classical Cut in 2012. The Schrodinger time scale or the Lake equation is linear. Uh, linear equation, linear psi, that you get Hamiltonian evolution from it, and therefore you get superposition and entanglement. And with a many particle wave function, you get fermi dirac statistics and Bose-Einstein statistics. I want to talk about essential and inessential non-linearities. So the essential linearities are these Hamiltonian evolution, superposition, entanglement, fermi dirac Bose-Einstein. Essential and inessential nonlinearities. I'm going to call inessential nonlinearities in the Hamiltonian. Find the diagram of result as a calculation tool, but nevertheless, the wave function is still propagated linearly. So it doesn't matter <coughs> if your Hamiltonian is nonlinear, the wave function still propagates linearly. The essential nonlinearities, one, is wave function collapse to an eigenstate or which takes place when a measurement takes place. Classical outcomes arise, in my view, by what are called contextual wave function collapse, which I wrote about with Barbara Grosso in 2018. And I don't buy a many worlds or many minds view where collapse never happens. Why? It's an attempt to claim that only in linear dynamics occurs, which is not the case. What about hidden variables such as pilot wave? Well, in my view, it has no cash value because it makes no difference to the outcome and you have no access to these hidden variables, so you can't do anything with that theory. It doesn't change the experimental results of quantum physics. This, so the first essential nonlinearity is wave function collapse to an eigenstate, which gives you a classical result. And the second is the square in Boyle's rule, giving you the probabilities. The wave function does not directly give probabilities, but through a square. And that's a really important nonlinearity, but we all understand that. What about real world quantum linearities? Well, superposition, it's been demonstrated at macro scales by fantastic experiments. And I'm talking about the real world linearities. Entanglement has been demonstrated at macro scales, again, in wonderful experiments. Now, to get these linear results, you must prevent nonlinear effects taking place. That means you need very precisely engineered contexts. Surfaces must be precise, very precise machines. Interaction with heat pass must be minimized. Usually, you have very low temperatures involved and decoherence must be fought by isolation. So you can get real-world quantum linearities, but under very restricted circumstances. Uh, in ordinary, everyday life situations, these basically are not going to happen. 
What about real, real non-linearity? So what are the non-linearities non we have to this? Uh, and I'm going to take as an example feedback control loops. Thousands of feedback control loops occur in biology where it's called homeostasis. It's the basis of a lot of engineering, for instance, in aircraft water pilots. In daily life, it occurs in thermostats, getting temperature controlled in our rooms. The feature of a feedback control loop is that the initial data is irrelevant to the outcome. The outcome is determined by the goal of the feedback control loops. Hence, this is not unitary dynamics because the initial data doesn't determine what happens. This can't be described by evolution of a single wave function, and it functions rather by branch and dynamics, and I'm going to explain a bit more. So, you have a control loop enabled by a structure, and this makes it into a cybernetic system. You have a controller, a system state, your goal, and a comparator. And you, the, the comparator compares the state with the goal, so if there's an error, you send an error message around to the controller that changes the control parameter that changes the system state, you compare again, and you go round and round with an error message. It's based on an information flow around the system, and that's the way that all feedback control systems work. Information flows through specifically constructed feedback control loops. It's not clear, but leads to branching dynamics. And the example is a thermostat for a room. The goal is a chosen temperature. And the dynamic is, if T is less than T0, then apply heat, else do not apply heat. That's the branching dynamics which comes out of that. The meta issue which underlies what I'm talking about is that each theory is a domain of application. Newtonian physics is very good within its domain of application. So is Galilean gravity, Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. This is perfectly good for engineering purposes. The question not asked nowadays is the following. Setting aside the issue of quantum gravity, where it is indeed asked, what is the domain of application of quantum theory? That is the key question one needs to ask. And it is limited. For example, feedback control. You can't characterize a feedback control system by a single quantum function obeying a Hamiltonian rule. I just kind of show you the dynamic. That's not a Hamiltonian dynamic. And here's a very important example by Barbara Drossel. Ten reasons why a thermalized system cannot be described by a mini particle wave function. And that is another example of where you can't use quantum physics for important everyday cases. As a prologue to my solution, I want to talk about a general relativity key idea, the idea of local coordinates. And atlases in general relativity enable global states. So you had a coordinate system x1 applied in a particular domain, a coordinate x2 applied in another domain, x4 in another one, x3 in another one. Each of these applies in a specific domain. Local coordinates cover part of a manifold, they're joined by overlap domains. The atlas, the entire atlas, covers the manifold globally. But often there's no single coordinate system exists for the whole manifold. For example, a two-sphere cannot be covered regularly by a single coordinate system. Use of atlases made global general relativity studies possible, for example, black holes and the various coordinate systems used to study black holes. I want to use the same idea in quantum physics by introducing the idea of local wave functions. Essentially, the same applies to quantum theory. The idea is that local wave functions exist everywhere, but in the real universe, no global wave function exists, nor a single wave function for most macro objects, such as a cat. Summary, quantum physics applies locally everywhere. The domain of validity of quantum theory is that local wave functions are restricted to, to domains where the dynamics is linear, so you have to test Given your claimed domain for application of a local wave function, is the dynamics linear or not? If it is, you're fine. If it isn't, you're not fine. So local wave functions, dynamics linear in each domain, combined they cover the, 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 the whole system, but no single wave function exists for the, for the whole. Nonlinearity is possible by combining the linear dynamics.
elements of local wave functions. That's the idea as I would like to suggest should be introduced to solve this conundrum. So in the feedback control system you might have one local wave function there, another local wave function covering those parts, another local wave function covering those parts, and when you put those linear uh, control system, wave function systems together, you get the nonlinear dynamics which I already talked about when I discussed feedback control systems. That's the idea. In that case, macro objects are classical. The Copenhagen interpretation effectively applies. The apparatus is classical, and you cannot describe it in terms of a single wave function because its dynamics are not linear. The apparatus dynamics are not linear. And an example is any quantum physics experimental paper. This is a build test by an aspect, and if you look at that, all is classical. The beam slitters, the detectors, the coincident detectors, excepting a few interacting particles. So that's classical, that's classical, that's classical, that's classical, that's classical, that is, and so is that. And if you think about it, you have to handle these real experimental situations this way, otherwise you couldn't actually deal with them. If you just try to describe each of these also by a quantum wave function, you would end up with a situation which you simply couldn't handle in a meaningful way. So, local wave functions mean macro objects are classical. Particularly, there's no single wave function for a cat as a whole. That's a consequence of what I've been saying. Why? Because there are millions of feedback control systems in a cat. So, there's no wave function for psi cat. And the equation for psi cat is A psi li plus B psi dead is not a legitimate equation. If you look at the situation, here the radioactive substance, the eye, the counter rear, the hammer, and all the rest of it, the only quantum feature is the set of excited atoms. Everything else in that diagram is classical and should rightly be represented as classical. And that's the way that one should understand what is happening in here. That's the classic, that's the quantum event, and all the rest of the stuff is classical. And you don't try to describe any of this by a wave function, so why should you describe, try and describe that by a wave function? As a consequence, there is no similar wave function for the universe as a whole, because cats exist in the universe. And so I don't believe in the wave function of the universe for the reasons I've discussed. And an interesting question which follows from this is astrophysical black holes. Why should there be a single wave function for an astrophysical black hole, that is for a real black hole in the real universe? And I'll leave that for you to think about. The second puzzle is the puzzle of complexity. Complex systems like digital computers, aircraft, cities, all of biology are modular hierarchical structures. They're modular, made up of modules, they're hierarchical, hierarchical structure and they're structured. And a very interesting discussion of why this is the case is a book by Grady Booch called Object Oriented Programming describes how it works in the case of digital computers. Complex systems of all of these are associated with function or purpose, whereas there's no purpose in physics. In biology, yes, there's indeed function and purpose, and an important paper of this is by Nobel Prize winner they are Hartwell and collaborators called from molecular to modular cell biology, and they emphasize this, how in biology there is always functional purpose, but not in physics. So how does this functional purpose arise out of physics? It arises by the properties of macromolecules, and John Murray Lane in his Nobel lecture talks about supramolecular chemistry, from molecular information towards self-organization in complex matter. It is the conformational properties, the changes of shape of macromolecules that underlies function at higher levels, and I'll give you an example in a minute. So we have the hierarchy of structure and causation, particles, atoms, chemistry, biochemistry, cell biology, neurology, botany, zoology, physiology, psychology, sociology, economics, and politics. There's different descriptions, variables, and effective laws at each level. Each Level has different variables which you use to describe it, different laws apply, applicable at each level, but there are effective laws at each level. Well, they're a bit fuzzy at these levels, but there are very good effective laws at all of those levels. 
So the same level of causation happens at every emergent level. The levels are linked by upward emergence due to coarse draining, circuitry breaking, or black boxing in the case of computational systems, and the levels are linked by downward effects due to time dependent constraints and the ability. Both in a minute. Together, the upward emergence and the downward effects enable the same level of effective laws to emerge. These effective laws exhibit contextually based logical branching. We've already seen an example in feedback systems. And generically, what happens at every emergent level is if Tx, then F1y, else F2y where y is a dynamic variable at level L and x is a control variable um, either at level L or at level L plus 1. And there's no longer a wave function description of this level because this kind of logical branching doesn't emerge out of Hamiltonian dynamics directly. It can emerge if you have your multiple uh, wave functions as I've just indicated, but it can't occur emerge out of a single wave function at any emergent level. So let's look at dynamic causation in the case of feedback control. It has an air conditioning thermostat and so with this complex mechanism, which is a controller, which determines if the temperature should go on and off. This is where you set it, the digital setting determines how hot the room becomes, and therefore that setting determines how fast molecules move in the room. That's dynamic causation from this setting to the motion of molecules in the room. A very, very clear example of dynamic causation. If you break the feedback loop, it won't work, even though all parts are there because you've broken the topology. It's a closed loop. If you disconnect the parts, the wrong topology is there and it won't work. The system is an emergent structure from the parts is connected so as to give the outcomes. And the system, the structure, constrains the flow of electrons and the wires. What electric wires do is they constrain where electrons flow from one part of a system to another. That's the functional nature of constraints. The whole is more than the sum of the parts. It's organization between the parts, like the organization here and the organization of the loop as a whole. And if you can see what happens if you swap the terminals, so the sign of the error signals change, you get different outcomes, you get a runaway heating or cooling of the room. Dark causation biology by constraints, homeostasis, feedback control, by oscillators, for instance, the heart and the lungs, through neural networks, the nervous system, and learning. An example is ion channels in axons in the brain, enables action potential spike chains to propagate in neurons, and I'll give you details of this in just a minute. So constraints are a form of dynamicization in biology. The second one is creating or changing to leading lower level elements. Generate Regulatory networks and metabolic networks do this. Developmental processes determine cell types and natural selection through adaptation to the environment shapes lower level elements, it changes them or deletes them. So constraints change what happens at lower levels and creating change or deleting lower level elements changes what happens. I'll give you an example of each. Ion channel protein controls ion flows across the cell wall. Here's the cell wall. The cell interior is here and the cell exterior is there. You've got ions, sodium ions outside. You've got the cell wall and an ion channel. And here, the voltage gradient is upwards. It goes in that direction, as you see. And in that case, the gate is closed and the ions can't come in. In this case, the voltage gradient is downwards. So the voltage gradient is that way. Right? And the gate is open, and so the ions can come through. And that's how. So this is the, the gradient is at a higher level than the ions. It's a it's a higher structural level than the level of the ions. And the voltage across, which is a higher level effect, determines whether the ions, lower level structures, can go through the gate or not. This enables logic to emerge from the underlying physics by conformation change and change of the shape of the molecule enables the logic to emerge. And the logic is if upward voltage, then channel closed, if downward voltage, then channel open. That's the logic that emerges. And that chains up to enable branching at higher emergence level. For example, this occurs 
in, 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 in uh, neurons, and that trains up to enable action potentials and eventually to enable thoughts to take place. Let's just look at the molecular structure. This is the gate seen from the side, side view when it's closed, and this is the view from the top when it's open, and there's the iron going through. And these are great big paddles which can move. They are here they are in the closed position. They, when, they, when the voltage is the other way, they open the loop at the side and allow the ion to go through. This is the top view. That's one of the panels, another one, another one, and another one. And so it's the actual shape of the thing and it's the change of shape of the thing when it is closed and then it moves to open and that allows the ion through. And that's the mechanism at the micro level which enables the logic to emerge. The key is the changing conformation shape of the protein ion channels, responding to an electric voltage across the cell wall, which is a much larger scale than the ion. And so you get a dynamic control of ion flows arising by change of shape or form. And that's the way that logic emerges from physics via the properties of proteins. Such molecules come to existence by evolutionary selection, as Andreas Wagner has emphasized. These are incredibly complicated. They couldn't have arisen just by chance. They have been selected to be what they are. So this is the example of natural selection and evolution. Natural selection results in genes and proteins. So here's a polar bear. The environment tells the animal it's good to be white. That tells the DNA sequences to make white fur. That tells the proteins to be right, and so what you have is this chaining down to gene regulatory networks, genes by gene regulatory networks to proteins, and you adapt to the environment and the selection principle is viral and reproduction, and that creates the lower level elements, shapes the lower level elements, so that's dominant selection from the environment into these proteins, such as the proteins we just looked at, which enable thoughts to take place. Different environment, Arctic snow versus the Canadian forest, will give you different genes and different color fur. Alter genes change material stuff proteins at the material level, as Andreas Bardner emphasizes. It's clearly multi-level. Each level is selected to enable ecological adaptation. The role of quantum physics in all of this is firstly to determine the nature of chemical elements via the Pauli extrusion principle leading to electron shells in all of the different elements. And then quantum chemistry applies, and so we have to go density functional theory, corpus levels and mar martial, multi scale models, highly nonlinear, local wave functions, area, everywhere. There couldn't possibly be one single wave function that determines this all. And my third subject is the puzzle of time. Does time pass, or do we live in a timeless world universe? Many claim that time does not does not pass because no present time is possible. Especially in group general relativity say you can't have a preferred time, so we must learn a block space time. Where does the key error of time at the macro levels come from? In the relevant microphysics, would they be like this time symmetric? These are the two questions. Note, there are many errors of time, not just thermodynamic. <coughs> there's thermodynamic, there's wave, there's electrodynamic, gravitational, and quantum. Does the universe have an age? And NASA says yes. NASA says an age of the universe is 13.7 billion years. Note, they don't say that is the age of galaxies in the universe. NASA says that is the age of the universe. So this is not a timeless block universe because it's got a preferred time at this moment. At this moment, the preferred time is the present day, and it has an age of 13.7 billion years. That means the universe is not a block space time. The universe was younger when nuclear synthesis and that decoupling took place. It will be older when the sun dies out. So time does indeed pass. I claim that this is an experimentally established result. The issue, which is normally not taken into account, we must deal with manifolds with boundary. Manifolds with a boundary rather than maximally extended manifolds. And when people say you live in a block universe, they're thinking of a maximally extended manifold. But the present universe is not a maximally extended manifold, it's a manifold with a boundary. This, the maximum extent one, represents what space-time will be when time has run its course. 
who have to represent it by a manifold with a time dependent component, which extends as time passes. So this is what I call an evolving block universe. So can time pass? The issue is raised, but simultaneous simultaneity is relative to motion. There are no preferred spatial surfaces. The standard Lorentz transformation is not. The answer we learned in 1916 that general relativity applies to the real universe, not special relativity. Okay, but to general coherence applies to geo, there can be no, no preferred spatial sections to define time because of general coherence. Answer. That is true of the theory in general, but this general coherence is not true of specific solutions. Emergence is always based in symmetry breaking. And Phil Anderson pointed that out in his famous paper, more is different. There are indeed preferred spatial sections and time-like lines in Robertson Walker cosmologies. Anybody who's dealt with Robertson Walker cosmologies knows there's preferred time lines, there's preferred spatial sections. Physics is based, in fact, on world lines, not spatial surfaces. There are preferred world lines even in perturbed Robertson Walker models, and those are the Ricci eigenlines. There is a global direction of time set by cosmology. It arises from the evolution of the universe from its initial state. The time T2 since the start of the universe is a greater time than time T1, then T2 is a later time than time T1. So we can have a coherent, a, a, a good idea of what are the earlier and later times. The direction of time then points from T1 to T2, which is globally determined by the evolution of the universe, the standard evolution we all learn about when we learn about cosmology. And here are two papers that talk about it, the arrow of time and the nature of space time, and myself with Barbara Drossel, the emergence of time. These are two papers which lay this all out in great detail. So here's the idea, the direction of time goes out of any evolving world. The universe space time has a future boundary, and the future of the boundary grows with time. That's an evolving world universe. There are local arrows of time which exist at each global time. There's a thermodynamic arrow of time, which is the popular one nowadays. It's the one that people almost only talk about. It requires special emission conditions in order to get a second law, which has been much discussed. It also requires a dark night sky, but there's a heat sink, which is not so much discussed, and that occurs because the universe is expanding. There's an electromagnetic arrow of time, which was much, dis much discussed into alien by Wheeler and Feynman. There's a radio infrared light ultraviolet X-ray gamma ray arrows of time. In each case, the radiation is received after it was emitted, and that defines an electromagnetic arrow of time. There's a gravitational arrow of time. Gravitational waves are received after they are emitted. Fluids and solids, sound waves, travel. You hear the sound after it was sent, not before. There's quantum error of time. There's lots of information takes place when wave function collapse takes place. You lose the information of what the state was before the collapse took place. There's biological birth, growth, decay, and death. There's mental remembering, decisions, and actions. There are many error of times. Well, the first question is why do they all point in the same direction? as the global arrow of time. Is that a coincidence or is there a reason for it? And the second one is, are they all the same everywhere in the universe? Is it possible when we look at distant galaxies, we can see a galaxy where time is going in the opposite direction? If that was true, how would you tell it was true? And so there are these local arrow of times. And here's the picture. There's the global direction of time. And this particular, here's the, the present, and the present is the volume of the time towards the future. Here's the future. The past, the start is here. The past exists. The present exists. The future doesn't yet exist because it hasn't yet happened. The direction of time passed from the start to the present, and all these local arrow times pass upwards like that and are correlated with the global arrow of time. The evolving block universe provides a context where the past exists but the future does not. It's not determined yet because of quantum uncertainty. And the dark night car serves as a heat sink because the universe is expanding. This is a case of dark causation from the cosmological context 
to work on physics. The reason they're all pointing in the same direction as the global error of time is because they are dynamically caused by the global error of time. And the final slide, dynamic causation occurs in many contexts in physics, and I'll just very briefly talk about them. Cooper pairs enable superconductivity. Why? Because superconductivity exists because of lattice distortions, as Bob Lachlan explains very dramatically in his Nobel lecture, you cannot deduce superconductivity in a strictly bottom-up way, and that's because that does not account for these lattice distortions. The lattice is at a higher level, emergent level, than the electrons, which convey electricity, and so this is dynamic causation from the lattice structure, the lattice distortions to the level of the electrons. And people said, what about Ohm's law? I did a derivation of Ohm's law in my first or second year physics course, so what's wrong with that derivation? And the answer is, what's wrong with that derivation is it denies that superconductivity exists. If you go back and look at your derivation, you'll find that it says superconductivity is not possible. And so that derivation <coughs> Phonons underlying thermal and optical properties of crystals are very similar. There are collective dynamics, collective oscillations of crystals latter less level, and those are down to create phonons which are, for all practical purposes, particles which interact with uh, uh, um, photons and cause the properties, optical and thermal properties, of crystals. A very interesting case of dynamic causation is the change of properties of free and electrons when they interact with photons. When an electron is free, it interacts with photons in a completely different way than when it's bound in an atom, because then it exists and it's a spectrum. So a bound electron in an atom exists a spectrum of free electron doesn't. So those are completely different properties. And if you characterize what a thing is by its interactions, particularly interaction with photons, this is a completely different change of properties. And another one is the change of light on the free and bound neutrons. Free neutrons decay about 11 uh, minutes. Bound ones live for billions of years. And that's because of the context, the bound context changes the properties of neutrons. That's a top down effect from the, the nucleus to the properties of the neutrons. Nucleosynthesis is completely different in the early universe when you only get up to lithium, and in stars when you get carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, which are needed for life. That's because the nuclear synthesis takes place in different contexts. That context of the universe acts down to get one set of outcomes, gives completely different outcomes and starts. Structure formation cosmology is another example. It is dependent on the background model. If you have a static universe, you get exponential growth of in homogeneities. If you have a power law universe, you get power law growth of structure. And if you have an exponentially growing universe, you get no growth of structure. That's dynamic formation, the dynamic causation of the cosmology, the structure formation. And finally, there are errors of time determined by the direction of time plus initial conditions. Thank you very much for the, the beautiful uh, lecture. So now, questions, comments. can clarify in the evolving block universe model the need to keep the past as real and why not keeping just a kind of thick present with a, a special foliation given the fact that we can consider maybe also in this context with a just a thick present uh, a relativistic perspective on the causal time passing with, uh, through information I don't know if you have any comment on, on this on the need to keep the past as real in your model. Could you maybe put the question on the chat and I can then see it? <laughs> chat, please. Yes, but perhaps it helps with 
Let's come here. Uh, this microphone is better. Well, if you can just. Uh, I think if you go forward and use that microphone, George will be able to hear you. Near yes. this microphone. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. I was wondering if you could clarify the need for keeping the past as real in the evolving block universe model. Yes, yes. So in the evolving block universe, the past is real because it has changed conditions today. For instance, the nuclear synthesis in stars in the past result in the atoms which are present in this room at the present moment. So the past must be real because it's changed conditions here and now. So therefore, I don't regard the only real thing as being the present time, as some people try to say. I, I regard the, <coughs> the whole of the past from, from the present time way back to the start of the universe as being real because my viewpoint on this is if something can be proven to change what happens in this world at the present time, one must say that it does exist. So that's my, my viewpoint. If something can affect material processes in this world at this moment, you have to say that it exists. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Uh, there is a lines for um, maybe it's better if you can sure. nearby yes. the no, you need to use that microphone. Thank you for the talk. Uh, uh, I enjoyed uh, your uh, representation of uh, what we call the Copenhagen interpretation, which says that uh, for large systems or for classical systems we don't apply uh, wave function and unitary uh, uh, quantum dynamics. The point is that we don't know where the limits are. And your construction would suggest that uh, the, the crossover depends on the size of the space-time region, uh, which may work, which may not work, because sometimes in a very narrow region, we have something which is totally classical. Yeah. And the other way around, it can happen that uh, in a kilometer long uh, region, we don't have anything which is not quantum. So it's a, 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 I like and appreciate your symbolic uh, uh, proposal that uh, uh, the wave functions are local, they map the whole universe that there is no single depression for the whole. But this is the point. We don't know where the limit is. And Nils uh, Bohr didn't uh, teach us. Yeah, okay. th thank you. Um, look, firstly, um, I've put forward what I think is quite a well thought out position on the references of how gay it's developed further. And so, where is the quantum classical cut? And I think the answer is. It doesn't depend simply on energy or on length scales. What it depends on is what interactions are taking place. And the question, and I did briefly mention it, but I'll say it again, the question is, are the interactions such that the uh, effective, what is effective happening remains linear or not? So for instance, Anton Zeiling's wonderful entanglement experiments over a very large distance takes place through a uh, vacuum where there, or, 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 or air, where the photons do not interact in a strong way with the interacting medium, and that enables the interaction to be a linear. In, in um, the quantum particles and experiments, <coughs> which establishment um, uh, uh, superposition over large scales, you, you cool it down until it becomes in, and so the, the, the operative question, there isn't a particular scale, what there is, is the question. The question is, are the interactions isolated from heat bars and so on in such a way that they can be regarded as linear, and in that case, you can hope to get a single wave function description, so that, that's the way that I understand it. Okay, uh, some more questions or comments? Uh, well, if not by myself, I might uh, uh, ask to you, uh, I mean, 
I saw this um, uh, interplay, let's say, between non-linearity and the linearity. And that is crucial. But uh, is that enough to explain how to go from a microscopic a physics quantum, let's say, as we know it, to macroscopic general view behaviors, for example, or in biology? The, the challenge to people who disagree with me is to show how you take quantum dynamics at the micro scale, you average it in some kind of way, or you have a broken symmetry or something, and you prove that you're going to get um, Hamilton, the, the linear Hamiltonian dynamics at the emergent scale. And what I'm claiming is that in the real world, you almost never get linear dynamics at the emergent scale. That's my claim. Okay, okay, thank you. So, uh, if there are no more questions or uh, comments, I would uh, thank you uh, once more. And let's thank. Thank you for having me, and I'm really sorry not to be with you in person, able to meet with you, but this is because of the Brexit event, and um, I'm in Hamburg for a long period, and I couldn't extend also to be with you, so my apologies. Okay, no, it's okay. Thank you very much anyway, and uh, see you next time uh, in full body, <laughs> in person. Okay, bye. Thank you.